did this come about, this opportunity to work in Antarctica? I met, I was, I was at a wedding of a friend, uh, a friend from Chicago, and I met a friend of his, uh, one of his high school buddies, who had been involved in the uh, U.S. Antarctic program. And um, he told me all about it and his experiences there, and it really sounded appealing. And he gave me instruction on who to contact and where to go. First of all, how many years have you done this? Have you gone and not been the captain but worked there? I started as a firefighter. I'm now a captain. Uh, so I've been a firefighter, lieutenant, now captain. Um, this last year was my ninth season working in Antarctica. Uh, seasons are broken up summer or winter. Um, summer months during the basically uh, sun's up and winter months the sun's, sun's not up. <laughs> it's pretty pretty that simple. Um, How has it changed from your first year to your ninth year? You know, I almost think like the first year is that ex exciting and also really hard to get used to these new conditions. I mean, tell me about the transition. It's that's a huge question. Um, the first, like from then to now, um, definitely the first year, everything is wonderful. Um, everything you're doing, you just, you find yourself putting uh, in Antarctica at the end. I can't believe I'm taking a shower in Antarctica. I can't believe I'm having a sandwich in Antarctica. You know, you throw, and you throw that at the end of everything, um, which is really great. Um, not so much now. I spent, uh, I think, about just about actually five years, five full years on the continent. Um, and after spending five years anywhere, you don't you don't look around. You go to a new neighborhood. It's like, hey, look at that great Indian restaurant. Now it's just the Indian restaurant, you know. <laughs> uh, so, so a lot of the wonder is gone. Uh, the day to day, like, but it never truly leaves. Um, I think. And a lot of people have said that if you ever lose the sense of wonder that for Antarctica, it's time to go home. You know, it's time to hang it up. So, I mean, it's still there. It's still like day to day. You'll see things. Uh, uh, I remember just one day, um, one day this summer, we walked, uh, some friends and I were working on a project over in one of the, uh, in the atmospheric research observatory at the South Pole, the Aero building. And we stepped outside. We were finished. We were walking back to the main station, looked up, and it was the most spectacular sun dogs. Uh, we're up in the sky, um, and we end up just standing there for, for about almost an hour until they sort of faded away. It's just something you don't normally see, and and uh, this one was particularly spectacular. It was just a, the, one of the most pure examples of a sun dog I've ever even heard of, and uh, and so that that whole sense of wonder is still there. It's like, I cannot believe I'm staring at this. I'm like right here at the South Pole looking at this. You work for a vendor, so... but. So you're not working technically for the U.S. government, but it's a U.S. government program? Correct. This is um, The Antarctic program is um, run by the National Science Foundation. It's, a, it's part of their um, purview, if you will. It's, it's one of their programs. And uh, it is run by vendors. And what are, what are they doing there? What is the National Science Foundation doing in Antarctica? What are they, st what are they researching? Uh, it's... What are they research? That that's a huge question. There, there's all sorts of different scientific research going on, but that basically is um, the underlying cause. Um, they're there for scientific research, um, be it uh, astrological, all right, biological. I mean, it, it goes into geological uh, study of wildlife, study of um, climate change, study of atmosphere, all kinds of things. Weekly, the different science groups give lectures on what they're doing. So when you're, when you're down um, in Antarctica, um, part of the, their contract stipulates that they're required to inform what they're inform the public what they're up to. The Antarctic Treaty uh, is signed by all these uh, participant, participating con countries, which states that um, they promise to only use the continent for scientific research. So all these different bases are scientific research stations. Okay. So and this year, you were the fire captain of the South pole station. That's correct. Uh, fire captain of Admiral Scott South Pole Station. And what are the responsibilities of the fire captain? Primarily to ensure the, um, we work with the, the Air Force and the Air National Guard to ensure the safety of the uh, aircraft, the air mission flying to the South Pole. That's the primary uh, mission. Secondary to that is uh, fire safety for the station itself and uh, the they have a 
a fire brigade, which uh, is made up of volunteers, a very, very good group of folks. Um, uh, but part of the mission of the fire captain is to assist in the training of that fire brigade to, um, at the South Pole itself. The paid professional fire department is only there during the summer season and the winter it's all turned over to the fire brigade. So it's essential that we get the fire brigade prepared for the winter season. So training them is a very, very important uh, part of that. So basically the, the safe application of the, of the uh, emergency response plan for the South Pole, uh, taking care of the aircraft and training the fire brigade would be the primary mission. I think when you first told me, the first thing you think of is what? What kind of fires are happening in that ice shelf? You know, like yeah, uh, that's the number one question I get. Um, almost every single person I've ever told my job has asked me, "You have fires in Antarctica or something like that?" There's what burns there? Well, you know, yeah, we have air, we have aircraft, we have vehicles, we have buildings, um, and it's very dry there. A lot of static buildup, a lot of like old electrical. Um, yeah, it's a uh, Fire is a real hazard, especially in a remote environment like that, where uh, um, where help could be a long way off. So, like, if say I'm coming, I'm coming as a tourist, which is nice. Okay. A lot of people start to come. Do you get? Do you, are you anywhere near these people? Is it nice? You get to see some new faces, or that's not even doesn't even come near you. I mean, how big is this landmass? It's huge. It, it's hard to even yeah. fathom. Too. What's what does it compare to? Um, the Antarctica, the Antarctic continent is about the same size as the U S and Mexico combined. So it's pretty big and it's very, very sparsely populated. I think at peak in the peak summer population is no more than about 5,000 to 5,500 on the entire continent. Um, with McMurdo being by far the largest population center, uh, McMurdo station where our fire department is based, um, um, that reaches a peak of 11 to 1,200. Uh, but we do have tour groups come to McMurdo, usually on ships. They'll come on in, um, and they'll either take a boat or they'll take a helicopter in, and they'll be wandering around in town. And, and you do get to interact with them. I had a, a, a pretty curious experience, I think, two years ago. Uh, maybe it, was, it might have been last year. They kind of run together. Um, where um, I had a friend, actually, a friend from New Zealand who was actually the tour group leader on one of those. And uh, I got to run into her in McMurdo at my firehouse. Like, so I ran, in, ran into a friend from New Zealand. Oh, hi. How are you? This connection, you, I mean, this thing you share with the people there. Yeah. I mean, I've done things and traveled, and I know the, a tiny percentage, I'm sure, of what you feel when I connect to people over something really fascinating in the world where I'm doing something with them for a week. And we're like, wow, we went to the Galapagos for a week or, you know, whatever yeah. it is. And so I know this tiny percentage of that because it's this neat, special thing, and you get this bond with these people. So tell me about that. That's one of the true benefits I wanted. Um, that's really what keeps me going back are some of the friendships you make. And it is a bonding over something really special and unique. And um, you make friendships that you know, like they're, they're insanely intense very, very quickly. And sometimes they just flare off. But when the ones that don't, um, these are friends you're going to have for forever and just really true um, lifelong friends that you're going to make there. Um, you've shared something that's unique, um, a common experience, a common sacrifice, if you will, to a certain degree. And, uh, and these friendships are just, they'll, they'll remain with you. And they're just uh, something that you can't, you come home and you try to explain uh, when you get back home and, and people don't understand. Um, and you start actually questioning the friendships you have back home because they're not based on the same level of commitment. If, you know what I mean? Intensity, like a... There's an intensity to them, yeah. Such a shared... It's, yeah, I, I can understand that it's something no shared one... Shared sacrifice, shared uh, hardship. It's, it's not as hard as some people might think, but there is a sense of... You know, you're away from your family... Um, and the only way you're going home is if you quit your job. Like, you're away from your family. You're away from what you know. You're in a new environment. Um, you surround yourself eventually with a new group of friends, and you've you've got this shared experience that no one else will know. Like, you go home, and no one will know this. Such a great perspective that a lot of people will never get to have. I mean, I can again, like I can relate in a tiny way, just from traveling around the world, being solo, being 
even that way making you more relaxed. But And I was thinking when you were like, you know, you go somewhere, you're away from your friends or family. So then there's the expat that, you know, moves to Paris or even Vietnam or somewhere, right? And they're dealing with what you're dealing with, except then this other huge difference of extremes where you are and that you don't just walk over to the store. I don't know, you know, and, and you yeah. can't just get in your go take a train somewhere else. <laughs> you can't nope. <laughs> like, there's no weekends off. There's no, uh, there's no changing your scenery. Um, at the South Pole, the scenery is, it's, it's white on the bottom and it's blue on the top. And that's all you got. There's no terrain features. It's flat snow. You better like blue on, blue on top and white on the bottom. Cause that's all you got. <laughs> but uh, all that being said, I mean, it, it does change uh, and it is beautiful. Another thing I wanted to add was, um, a lack of judgment. You know, you stop judging people by um, outward appearances, which is something because you lo- you quickly learn. Like that guy who's um, driving that forklift. I mean, he's a award winning author and he's he's an English professor. And the, the the girl washing your dishes as a doctorate in law from, from Georgetown and the, uh, you know, it's, it's you, you stop judging people by your own perceptions and you learn just to find out who people are, which is truly amazing. Uh-huh. Wait, yeah, it's, that's one of those transformative things I was alluding to. It's you, like, you see, you got someone and you learn to just, you know, Hey, who are you? Rather than, uh, here's what I think you are. And so you were telling me before about the sun when you're there, yeah, people, you know, people might not think about it, that. The summer, the sky, the sun is up, and in the winter, the sun is down, and it's twenty four hours of sunlight or twenty four hours of darkness. Um, and the sun, you know, it just spirals around the sky above you like this, and you just and as it goes up, you know, that's peak of summer. Then it starts coming back down, and then it starts hitting the horizon. You turn have your transition to night, and then it's darker and darker and darker until you have full darkness for uh depends you know the farther south you go the longer the pure darkness is um winter's there about eight months long um and winters in mcmurdo it's about sunsets in i think it already happened in march and it'll it'll rise in august how was that when you were there for the winter i loved it being dark (laughs) Uh, absolutely, it's, I love it. That's it's anti-human so in a way, right? That goes against like it's what, against what most people would think. Oh, I couldn't handle the dark. I absolutely found it fascinating that it was dark all the time. I, I absolutely loved it. Um, the stars are amazing. Um, uh, the Austra, um, the uh, auroras, um, the, the 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 you can see the plants. You can see satellites going by. It's so clear. Oh my god! <laughs> and and also, let's talk about the temperature for summer, winter. Like, how you loved the winter because you loved the darkness. How is the temperature? Um, Did you it love gets that? Pretty cold. Yeah. Um, McMurdo is a little more mild than South Pole. Obviously, it's a coastal area, and it's going to be a little more affected by um, by the seasonal change. I guess. The coldest I've ever personally experienced was minus 126 wind chill and about minus 80 something ambient. But uh, that's in McMurdo. And, uh, and we're in Fahrenheit. Are you in Fahrenheit? Or it doesn't yeah. even matter at that point. It kind of goes back together, doesn't it? Get back together. Uh, minus 40 is uh, where Celsius and Fahrenheit hit. They're identical temperature at minus 40. Um, but yeah, minus 40 is pretty typical in the winter. Um, if you're in McMurdo, it's much colder at the South Pole, uh, where they'll hit minus 100 Fahrenheit uh, ambient. What do you do with that temperature? Like, what can what can you do? Do you go out they, for a second? <laughs> I mean, your um, cells they, start to um, break down. Like, I don't even. You have to be you have to be careful. Um, it's the wind that's the big problem. Um, but uh, you dress warmly. Layers you layer up. You cover everything exposed. We have you know you learn. Like anything else, you'll learn how to, how to cover up and how to take care of yourself. Do you guys have certain terminology for stuff like regular stuff? I'm sure you do. Like stuff that we do. Like I was even just thinking about like, you know, if you live in Alaska, 
Everything else is like the lower 48. So what is everything else to you guys? Like what are you? The world. And where are you? Like what? how do you relate? We're, we're the ice. We're on the ice. And that's the world. Cool. Okay. And uh, we refer to. Uh, we're based out of Christchurch, New Zealand, which we call Cheech. For the, is, and uh, especially over the winter, Cheech becomes like this Shangri-La that you're dreaming of. Like you're. And you're, oh, I'm going to go in three weeks, I'll be in Cheech. You know, it's, how often can you, like, if you want to go away and get go to New Zealand, how can you go? You can't go. No. There's no vacation. No. You sign a contract, and uh, under there are certain circumstances that uh, you can. Um, they're pretty severe, though. Where do you eat? It's all the same place, or are there actual restaurants? How does that no. work? No, uh, it's all it's cafeteria dining. Um, there is a, uh, each station has a galley. Uh, it's, we got a team of cooks and prep cooks, chef, you know, um, and they prepare three to four meals a day for whoever the population is. Uh, McMurdo, it's 1200. Sometimes it, our kitchen is cooking four meals a day, um, which is a lot of food prep and a lot of work. Um, but everyone eats there. Everyone eats in one central location. And sometimes the food's good, and sometimes you wish you could go to Taco Bell. <laughs> and can you cook ever? Is there any kitchen you can use if you want to cook? Yes, you can find a kitchen. like that. We have a, um, in the firehouse in McMurdo, we have a kitchen, um, and uh, which is great. And, and we have one because, you know, we are there. 48 hour shift and we're living in the building so we have a kitchen so we can prep food and cook cook up food when the uh, when the galley's not open um, that being said getting stuff to cook is a challenge yeah I was gonna ask that if you have a special request to you you can sometimes yeah it's some it's some years it's more difficult than others um, I'm trying to cook for especially when you got a fire department of 50 something people and trying to cook for them and um, just making like one time we wanted to make chili and I remember we had to go, we had people coming in from New Zealand, they're on their way down and we had them all each stop and get ingredients on the way down and paid the one they got there so we could make chili for everybody. <laughs> okay, and you can't just like run off to the French place to get a French meal? No, they're a few hundred miles away. They're, <laughs> they're not close. <laughs> and okay, so what else about your, your, your everyday living? Uh, your, you know, the conditions, where do you, what, what do you live in? Uh, where do you sleep? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, we live in dormitories. Um, and this changes, um, by station as well. Um, South pole, for instance, everyone gets their own room, which is great. They're, they're tiny on uh, the size of a broom closet, but they're comfortable, warm and private. And that's much more yeah. important. Um, everything's really compact. You had a bed, and your room is just a little bit bigger than your bed, and and that's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Um, McMurdo, in some of the buildings, you have up to six people sharing one room, um, and that is uh, that's a real challenge. Um, sharing a room with four people, five people, it's not. It, it's a hardship for sure. Uh, Are people so. some of these people married that come? I yeah. guess right. That must be so. I can't even. It's not, it's not bad for married couples who get to go together. It's bad for the ones who, who don't get to bring their spouse with them. It's, um, there's plenty of married couples down there, uh, plenty who have met down there. Um, uh, yeah, when you were, I was just, I guess I was thinking when it kind of, of course, when you said you, you don't have any alone space and you're there for, what, six, eight months and maybe you're dating someone there, where do you go? What do you, how do you go on a date? You get very inventive. <laughs> you figure stuff out. Um, I was I was on a date, and speaking of which, you know, when I was going on a date, and uh, I scheduled it with we had to do a shakedown drive on one of our trucks had been repaired, and I needed to take it for a ride out onto the ice shelf. Wait, shakedown? That sounds like some code for something on your date. No, no I just need to um, drive it, test it. It needed to be driven. Um, and so I turned that into a day <laughs> driving the truck out on the ice shelf. Because you're alone. Turned. Yeah. It's like oh, you can't go. It was winter. You can't go by yourself. You need to bring someone. So I 
you make it into a, a thing. Like, hey, how about we go for a drive on the ice shelf? Yeah. Any, anything you get out of town. It's, cool. it's a lot of make your own fun. We play a lot of cards. Cribbage is a huge game. Uh, play a lot of cards, a lot of, a lot of board games and such. Um, a lot of silliness. Um, people just make stuff up. It's like when you're kids, right? You have to be imaginative and just sort yeah. of... Yeah, very. Um, people make their own fun. A lot of, lot of costume parties. A uh, lot of I mean, many more costume parties than you'd think a group of adults would have. Uh, uh, bingo nights are popular. Uh, open mic night, karaoke. A um, lot of there tends to be a lot of musical talent down there, so bands will play. Uh, people will. Have classes like I, uh, we had writing classes and photography classes and whatever. Someone has a skill, they'll come down and they'll teach it. So tell me the hardest parts, like what you don't like about it, and what are the hardest parts of this life down there? This I, I love so many things about it. Um, it is the work is difficult. It's uh, the hours are tremendously long. Um, you can work from uh, for weeks on end every day. Um, worked. Uh, 7.30 in the morning to like 2 o'clock in the morning because of the schedule. And that was six days a week for for about three and a half weeks. Um, so it gets pretty tiring. Um, being separated from your family and friends when um, you miss the births and the deaths and the marriages. And I haven't been to a, to a wedding and all my friends keep getting married and I haven't been to one of their weddings. I keep skipping them because I'm not in the country. Um you miss opportunities like that. There's a tremendous sense of distance sometimes and, uh, and the loneliness that goes with it. What's the best part? What do you love about it? What obviously keeps you going back year after year? You mentioned like the relationships. And it's, it's the people. You know, there's an old saying that, um, <laughs> it's funny, I heard this my first year and I didn't get it till my third year, um, <laughs> that um, the first time you go for the adventure, the second time you go for the money, and the third time you go because you just don't fit in anywhere else anymore. <laughs> but uh, it's for me why I keep going back. It's definitely the the people I know. It's definitely it's uh, certainly not to uh, work those hours. It's not to. Um, I'm not going to make the the huge paycheck because it's not a. You're not going to get wealthy doing this job, but uh, not in money anyway. Uh, made a lot of friends and there a lot of really wonderful experiences. What's it like coming home every time? I mean, you're used to it in a way now, but obviously these transitions of like the marketing we talked about, the just so much in your face. Like, what's that yeah. like? It's um, it's gotten easier. I mean, I've done it nine times now, so it's gotten easier over time. But the first couple of times was very, very difficult um, readjusting to the pace. Um, the world compared to what I was used to seemed loud and angry. Um, it was very aggressive um, and comparatively very selfish. Like I'm, I'm used to a group of people that that take care of each other, and and you know everyone, and, and and if you need something, there's people just provided for you. Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, here you go. That's and you come back to you come back to the world as it, as it were, and. Everyone's focused on their their own agendas and and schedules and and there's media everywhere and everything's loud and there's cars and dogs and sirens and telephones and it's overwhelming to a degree sometimes. And what's next? I know you said it's unsure. Do you want to go back? Do you want? Do you think? I mean, it seems like it also keeps pulling you back. There's some it does. intense either way, right? The good and the bad. It does. Um, you know, I've been there long enough. I start, uh, even though I'm a contractor, I sign a, um, I, my job, I sign a contract for a specific time period. I go and I work from them till then, and then I'm done. Uh, however, I've been with the department so long, it's hard not to feel a sense of ownership and pride in it. You don't want to miss out almost. Like, what if you don't go next year? You miss out on something, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll miss out or, or, you know, it's like I want to see the department succeed and, and I want to help it succeed. And I have a, a, a huge um, commitment to the department I've in many ways tried to help build for the past, you know, few years. You can't. I, I think Antarctica changes a person when you go. You don't come back the same if you allow it. 
Um, there are some people who go for a very short period of time, they're very negative about the experience, and don't like it and come back just as negative. But if you allow uh, Antarctica to take hold of you, it does change you in profound ways. And, and uh, that's one of the, like, the key things about it that I just find so amazing. It's just this transformative effect it has on people. How have you changed? Uh, much more... Uh, much more easygoing, um, less um, materialistic, more concerned with uh, the true things that matter. Um, definitely just calmer, more relaxed, more, more interested in, like, no interest in technology, no interest in, in the latest fad or gadget or anything. I'm more concerned, like when I go to meet a friend, I don't want to sit there and play with my my cell phone I want to actually talk to my friend and um, more connection with the immediate with the right now less of um, less worries about things don't don't worry about uh, figure everything's just gonna handle itself it'll it'll work out because you've been places where it, it, it had to right it there's has no to work. yeah yeah <laughs> if it doesn't you're got a you got a big problem so you'll make it work but well, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. It's been really amazing, really incredible. It's, it's been fun talking to you again.